everyone and welcome to the 13th meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing in 2017. Apologies have been received today from Liam MacArthur. Agenda item one today is an evidence session on Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary in Scotland's review of the Scottish Police Authority. And can I welcome Derek Penman, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland, and Jill Emery, Assistant Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland, to the meeting. And Mr Penman helpfully provided the subcommittee and others with an embargoed copy of the HMICS report prior to publication. And being providing provided an advanced copy is a privilege that helps us with our work as committee members and it is very much appreciated. And I was therefore greatly disappointed that the contents of this report appeared in the media before it was laid in Parliament. Can I invite uh, Mr Penman to make a, a short opening statement to committee? Mr Penman. Uh, thank you, Convener. If I can, thank you for your comments in relation to the embargoed report. Uh, if I may, just, just for um, a, a minute, just differentiate uh, our report from a confidential document that was leaked to one that was embargoed and was effectively a public document. Um, also, from our perspective, we only embargo any documents really to support the convention of not publicising a report before it's laid in Parliament, and that's the, the, really the only reason and only time that we would uh, embargo that. And that's effectively to allow key stakeholders to uh, be able to respond to the report. Um, it's definitely not intended to restrict its contents or publication. Um, we took a different approach in this time in terms of the 30 post reports we have done previously and not had an issue um, with embargo, but I was very keen that a number of um, external stakeholders were able to see the report prior to publication, and also I was keen to make sure that we could facilitate that parliamentary scrutiny um, by your committee. Um, there is a disappointment that the, um, the embargo was breached, um, more for the impact on others than on ourselves, because it meant people yesterday were forced to comment when they were expecting to comment today. Um, it would be my intention to write to everybody who received an embargoed copy um, really just to request that they consider their own document handling arrangements uh, and provide assurances over future arrangements, just to allow me to inform my way going forward. But that was um, my intention to, to deal with that, and thank you for your comments. Um, if I may um, move on, if I can thank the committee for its invitation to provide evidence on the inspection report into openness and transparency of the Scottish Police Authority, and also acknowledge and thank the um, uh, the committee for its scrutiny and also that of the post public audit and post legislative scrutiny committee. Um, we have closely followed the evidence sessions um, and we have taken cognizance of the issues raised by members uh, in conducting our inspections. Um, as you will be aware, I had initially planned a, a major inspection of the Police Authority during 2017, but we received a request from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice on the 20th of April to bring forward elements of transparency and accountability. Um, I would like the opportunity to thank Audit Scotland, who has supported HMIC in our inspection work, and they have worked with my team and accompanied them on our field work uh, and also our interviews with board members and others. Um, that approach is consistent with our statutory duty to cooperate and share information. As you are aware, my report the report was laid before Parliament yesterday, and copies have been provided to members in advance of this session. While the report contains a number of key findings, my overall summary is that there is a need for the authority to genuinely engage with its stakeholders and listen to the views of those with an interest in the policing of Scotland. I have previously commented that effective scrutiny of policing in Scotland is essential in maintaining both legitimacy and public confidence. The scrutiny of policing must not only be effective, it must also be seen to be effective. While there have been positive improvements under the current chair, the recent parliamentary scrutiny and media concerns over openness and transparency have, in my opinion, weakened confidence in the SPA and detracted from its ability to perform its statutory function. While I recognise and fully support the need for members to have private space and receive confidential briefings in support of their role, I firmly believe that the formal scrutiny um, of policing in Scotland should be conducted in public. My report welcomes uh, the recent decision by the SBA to revert to holding its committee meetings in public and publishing papers in advance, but concludes that there is a need to listen to the views of stakeholders to maintain public confidence, and on this occasion I consider that the SBA has failed to do so until it has been pressed by parliamentary committees. The SBA must recognise the legitimate interests of parliament, local authorities, staff associations, the press and the wider public in the scrutiny of policing in Scotland. Our report also looked at the issues arising from the recent resignation of board member Moy Alley and acknowledged that she has acted fully in accordance with on-board guidance. The report also highlights there has been acceptance by the Chair that he did not deal with Moy Alley appropriately and he has since made a public apology. 
I have also identified weakness in the current executive structures, and I welcome the recent announcement by the Cabinet Secretary for Justice that there will be a review of the way that the SPA Board can be better supported to deliver its statutory functions. As I said earlier, the report acknowledges positive signs of improvement within the SPA Board operations over the last 18 months. The relationships between SPA and Police Scotland have improved significantly, and the sheer development of Policing 2026 strategy has been a major milestone. However, in my opinion, the effective implementation of the strategy will be critical in building a modern and sustainable police service, and this will require effective governance and the genuine engagement with stakeholders. Other developments, including improved financial reporting, investment and change management, governance of police call handling, and implementation of board and committee work plans, are all evidence of good progress that we have identified in the report. There is also a genuine commitment from the Chair and all members to support policing and drive improvement, and I would want to recognise that staff at all levels and authority are working hard and doing their best to support policing. Um, just finally, it is important, I think, to acknowledge that there have been significant improvements under the single service. The recent response by Police Scotland to the increased threat level to critical is a real example where the speed of response and the level of coordination would simply not have been possible under legacy force arrangements. However, for me, there is a real risk that the continuing focus on the SPA and its weakness in governance will limit opportunities to highlight and indeed publicly scrutinise positive developments in policing. I think this has the potential not only to impact negatively on confidence in the SPA, but could have an impact more widely on the public's confidence in Police Scotland. I firmly believe there is a need to look to the future to galvanise around the improvements that we have identified to strengthen the SPA and collectively develop efficient and effective scrutiny arrangements for policing of Scotland that genuinely add value. HMICS and myself will work closely with authority and other stakeholders to drive these improvements as quickly as possible. Thank you. Um, thank you um, very much, Mr Penman, for making that opening statement. We will move directly to questions. But before I do that, can I just remind uh, members and witnesses that we are under um, a, a great deal of pressure today, time-wise, and we need to conclude this meeting at, at, at two o'clock. There may be some issues that um, members won't have the opportunity to um, question you on, Mr Penman, and I would be grateful if we contacted you, if you'd be able to um, provide us with written answers to some further questions. Of course. Right, and can I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and papers two and three, which are private papers. And perhaps, um, Mr Penman, can I start by asking you about um, the uh, the need to hold um, SPA meetings in, in public. There has been much discussion, as, as you'll be aware, in, in committee meetings and in the media about whether meetings should be in, in public or in private. Um, and I, I accept that your report um, highlights this, as did other reports, but I, I note there is some... Um, lack of support from some board members uh, as, as to the need to hold meetings in, in public. Do you think that there should be strong guidance and cr criteria for what should be held in public and what should be held in private? Um, absolutely is the short answer. I mean, I think in terms of the criteria, paragraph 21 of our report refers to the legislation. I mean, Parliament has made it clear in the legislation that um, not only um, committee uh, meetings, but committees and subcommittees should be held in public. It does allow for the authority to, um, to decide that some or all of them could be held in private. My interpretation of that is there's a strong presumption um, that meetings should be held in public and the proceedings, I think, should be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis, um, much in the same way that local authorities and, I would imagine, yourself conduct your business um, rather than holding general pieces of business from that. Um, we have made a recommendation um, here that, that uh, there's a need for the authority to actually develop its own processes and procedures to be clear about what is being held in public and what will be held in private and also to have a process where that's discussed between between the chief executive and the chair or chairs of the committees, but also the papers that are to held to be um, a conveyed in uh, private are actually endorsed with that as well. So there's an audit trail and a rationale on a case-by-case -case basis. So we've been quite firm, I think, in this report um, around the, uh, the need to have um, the, anything that's done in private to be properly accounted for. OK. I believe I have two supplementaries, one from Ben and one from um, Stuart. Can I appeal to you to make your supplementary as brief as possible? Yeah, just, as brief. Just, ben. just, just at this, this this juncture, thank you, thank you, Vina. I, I would be interested. Um, <clears throat> why um, were you able to ascertain why the current practice of holding a private pre-meeting on the day of formal board meetings was was introduced? 
Uh, uh, why was that? There was that presumption on on private meetings. And, and our, our comment around the pre-meeting on the day of the public board. I mean, I, I think probably that's generally would be general practice, whether it be a pre-agenda meeting or there'd be an opportunity to brief members on anything that was going to be particular or a change of circumstances around the paper. What we had picked up on was the the potential for that to be perceived or indeed for it to be conducted as a pre-meeting or a rehearsal for the full board. So our recommendation is that although it's appropriate to have a pre-agenda meeting to discuss the business, it would be uh, inappropriate to run effectively a, a, a private meeting beforehand and rehearse effectively uh, the discussions. Our concern would be that you, the members would dis discuss the substantive issues in the main meeting in private and then when you come to have the meeting in public it becomes perfunctory and things go through in an odd and then that deprives the public and other stakeholders to understand the discussions. And was the concern around that because of the presumption uh, historically to, to hold meetings in private? Um, I think it became the, 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 the practice, if you like, with the SP where they were, they were having these meetings. But I think there's also a, a clear element for us around, uh, from the, the governance review, um, that the, the chair and others felt that they should have the committee meetings in, in, in private, and that was the best way for them to conduct their business. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, do you think it would aid transparency if the board always publish reasons why a particular agenda item has been held in private? Yes, is a short answer, and, and, and a recommendation effectively. Um, we see, I would envisage a state where if there was an, an agenda item or a paper being held in closed session, rather than private perhaps, but in closed session, um, then the rationale for that being there would be included on the top of the paper in the header, so that there is actually, you know, there is some transparency around the decision making of that. But we'd also expect agendas um, for closed sessions to, them, to at least indicate that the, the substantive matters are being discussed, if not the detail. The only exceptions to that would be areas of things like national security. John, yeah. very brief. Yeah, um, a very specific point from your report, Mr Penman. You, you say, I consider the decision in August 2016 to allow committee chairs to hold meetings in private was precipitous and should not have been implemented until former board approval uh, um, of the new corporate governance framework in December 2016. Was that decision made unilaterally by the chair? Was there any challenge to that by uh, other senior members of management? Uh, and, and specifically, are you aware of the chief executive challenged that decision? Please. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not. The reason it's precipitous was good governance for me would have looked like all of that being discussed and those proposals being taken forward and then agreed at a formal meeting of the board. What happened is that actually they moved to the practice without having the formal discussion uh, and decision at the board, which we felt made it precipitous. And specifically, are you aware of any challenge to that decision from the chief executive at all? No, not specifically. I'm, I'm aware clearly, as the report reflects, that we're, there are views of members generally about holding meetings in private um, around that, and they're probably well known um, from there, but I'm not aware um, specifically. I don't know if, if Jill is aware of anything. I, I think it's the position of most board members that there was a, an expectation the Cabinet Secretary having written to the board in June accepting the recommendations that that was the go-ahead to implement the governance review in its entirety and that the fact that the chair had indicated an intention to review the review in six months' time gave comfort to members that anything that emerged would be looked at again in quite a short period of time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Recommendation 8 in um, your report is a recommendation that a development session with the Chair, Chief Exec and all board members should go ahead to ensure there's a consistent and clear understanding of guidance. Do you have a concern that the, the, the dysfunctional relationship between the Chair and the Chief Executive of the board impacted the board in the way it functioned and operated? Um, I mean, f for me, I think I've drawn in the report what you would consider to be a, a, a good functioning relationship between the chair and the chief executive, and that's come from guidance provided by Audit Scotland to all boards. And we would say probably we, we did not find evidence of that within um, within the SBA. I think that recommendation there actually is more pointed towards our discussions with members and testing their understanding of on-board mm. guidance, and in particular the issue around collective responsibility. And, and what we found among some members is they, they, I think they found it would be inconsistent if they dis dissented against an agreement they would then find that difficult to publicly support it mm. and their view among some members would be if they did dissent they would have to resign from the board that's not what onboard guidance says in fact it encourages um, I think um, a free and frank exchange of views so that recommendation there is really we mm. think I need to get everybody who's involved in the SPA members and officers together so there's a shared understanding that everybody um, is aware of what they can and cannot do. But is it not a surprise to you that particularly the position of chair and chief executive would, would appear to be unaware 
um, of, of that kind of good practice? I, I mean, I, again, my, my, my view would be that it was the chair who um, has misinterpreted the guidance in relation to that, and that followed through in the letter from Moy Ali rather than mm -hmm. the chief executive. In fact, my understanding is the chair didn't discuss it with the chief executive and didn't give him an opportunity at that stage to um, say that the chair's interpretation was wrong. So I, I don't have the evidence to say that the chief executive's understanding of onboard guidance is wrong. What I do have evidence of is that the chair's interpretation of it was unduly narrow under those circumstances um, from it, and um, effectively. Um, that had a, a, an impact on, I think, his, his dealings with Moy Alley. OK, thank you. Stuart? Uh, thank you. I, I have some experience, both in my ministerial life and before I came to Parliament, of difficulties between executives and non-executives. Uh, I just want to ask, was some of the difficulty between the executive, uh, chief executive, who's an executive, and the chair, who is essentially non-executive, due to a misunderstanding on anybody's part that one managed and the other had oversight? Yeah, I, again, I'm referring to paragraph 127 in my report that sets out about you know, being essential the roles of the chair and chief executive are clear in the relationships. I don't think they were within the SPA. I think there was, uh, um, there's also issues in relation to the extent to which the chair and members would draw on the um, advice of the chief executive um, as well. Um, there's also a wider issue that we identified in the report as well, which would be um, non-executive members um, effectively forming the role of um, executive members um, in, in some cases. So we're not, we're, we're board members are effectively doing the work of executive members in, in, in many cases to fill gaps and to do, um, to do the right thing and are working hard to do that. But that's another thing that we have picked up on too. Uh, very briefly, and just perhaps to close this off, uh, does that therefore lead us to a position of that we need to go beyond simply codes of conduct to actually providing training to board members as to what it is like to be a non-executive, as distinct from perhaps many of the roles these people may have fulfilled in other parts of their life where they filled an executive role and moving to non-executive is a pretty fundamental uh, transition that not everyone is readily capable of making. I, I think that's a very good point. I think onboard guidance, the training the Scottish Government have got, should address that. Um, there are perhaps some other issues in relation to maturity of Police Scotland at certain stages mm -hmm. and the turnover of staff uh, at director level within Police Scotland that is leading some of the non-exec directors to behave uh, and fulfil that role. I would need to say I'm not criticising them for doing it or no. how they're performing it, but there is an issue, I think, about borrowing some of that until that stabilises. John. Oh, right, OK, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's not as choreographed as I thought. Um, right, OK. Right. Um, I, I'd like to ask you about the, the role of staff associations, uh, Mr Penman, because you, you do allude to that in your report, and indeed a, a new phrase on me, the strategic engagement forums. Now, I understand that the chief executive initiated quarterly and six-monthly meetings, and is that sufficient? It certainly wouldn't have been uh, my relationship with senior people when I held a, a staff association position. Um, and more importantly, do you know if this comes about as a result of engagement with the staff associations and unions? Um, my, my, I mean, these are not my words, they're the authorities' words in terms of the forum. And I yeah, think no, the, no. the intention behind that was to create a structure where the chief executive, not the chair and the members, but the, the chief executive could actually start to engage with um, the staff associations. Uh, I mean, I think there's a, there's a theme throughout our report about the authority um, understanding and respecting the, the role the staff associations play in policing. Um, as, you, as you know very well, Mr Finney, you know, the, the Police Federation has uh, a statute duty around welfare, but also a duty around efficiency of the service, and they're not necessarily a trade union per se, mm -hmm. um, and they're not just about the terms and conditions of their staff, they are very much around efficiency of the service. And I know that the committee draws heavily on staff associations, and I know the reason you do that is because you want to understand what the issues are that are affecting policing. I would say that is the same approach that should be applied consistently by the police authority, by the chair and by the, and the members. Um, we found this, our engagement with staff association has been very productive. Unison in particular um, you know, always provide us with a real quality uh, information and product around that. So my, my, my short answer would be um, that it's critical that the authority understand the role of staff associations and engage with them fully. If I can push you on, do, do you know if that structure was put in place following consultation with the staff associations unions at all? Um, it, it may have been involving engagement with them um, uh, in terms of that was what was looked at. I, I do know, though, and the report says that the, the staff associations do not think that is sufficient and are looking for further uh, and more improved ways of engagement. 
It's, it's very difficult to argue against having a forum to discuss matters, but uh, engagement should be on an ongoing basis. Um, and I wonder if it suggests a malaise that you need to put a structure in if um, a relationship isn't such that people feel they can pick up, pick up the phone. Because it is, of course, beyond welfare and efficiency. It is also, in many instances, when there's a substantive change in the workplace, it's a statutory obligation for consultation with the staff associations and unions. Yeah, and my, my experience as a chief officer in policing and others are that you would, you would want to have an open-door policy and a good engagement with the staff associations who are able to come and raise issues with you informally and give you opportunity to deal with them um, as well. I mean, one of the issues for me in this um, was about um, not excluding staff associations from the committee meetings. Um, because there's a real value in them being able to attend that to hear um, first hand. Having said that, the People Committee and the Chair of that has introduced a process recently that is looking to invite staff associations and rather than just to sit in the room and observe, she has asked them to come in, sit around the table and participate, um, not as members, but to be able to participate in the meeting, which I think is a, a very helpful way forward. OK, thank you very much. Margaret. Um, good afternoon. In the report, it, it highlights the fact that um, there was concern about the, the lack of genuine engagement and a failure to respond to the concerns of stakeholders. Did you form a view of how this culture had um, allowed or was allowed to, to um, develop within the organisation? Uh, sorry. sorry. I could maybe just um, start by talking about the feedback from board members. And there was a sense from interviews with board members um, that, that there was a huge task and that they were very committed to achieving improvements for policing, but that perhaps stakeholders, including media and the public, um, weren't recognised as part of the solution to addressing those issues and, and hence this desire to, to get on with the task as they might have seen it, as opposed to engage and have the distraction of taking on opinions from elsewhere. I find that astounding, given stakeholders included the SPF, you know, who, who better to tell them and give them exactly the kind of information that they so desperately needed to hear in order to, to have the review. But if I could move on to... I mean, have you, is that it, really? That, that was the reason why they wanted, they, they thought they were best placed just to, to look at the issues themselves and move on, and stakeholders were really just a, a, a hindrance and an irritation? I think, um, clearly, board members wouldn't recognise that description at all, but there is a sense from the, their interviews that they were very committed to achieving improvements um, that perhaps hadn't quite recognised the, the need to include others in order to arrive at those, at those solutions. Mr Perman. There was also, um, in terms of the governance review, there was a, um, a group put together from various stakeholders. There was evidence to show that the, the views were, were, were sought um, from those individuals. It wasn't clear how they then went through and were permeated into the actual outcomes from that. There was also an expectation among stakeholders, although they were initially involved in the detail of the, the implementation of the governance review, they weren't in engaged any time after that. And there was certainly a, a degree of unhappiness among stakeholders that they, they weren't involved until such times as it was basically put as a done deal um, at committee. So, again, I think I said in open remarks, the key learning from this is about the authority's ability to engage um, genuinely and effectively with stakeholders. And what recommendation have you put in place that you think will um, <coughs> achieve that aim if they follow it? I think it's just a general theme without a report. We didn't actually did dwell on a, an individual uh, item for that. For me, I think it comes through um, the, the whole a number of our recommendations about having that uh, um, that as a kind of key theme uh, moving through um, from there. We, did, we didn't make a recommendation specifically about improving stakeholder engagement. I think it's in, implicit um, through our report, and certainly we'll be looking for that and evidence of improvement uh, in the various things as we move through. With respect, uh, when the SPA is concerned, there doesn't seem to be anything you take for granted as implicit. Um, but if I could move on, you mentioned media, and you described the board's decision to prohibit the media reporting prior to meetings by embargoing papers as not desirable or su sustainable. Could you elaborate on that? And indeed, what, what, what seems to have happened as a practice recently is where papers are uploaded to the public website um, in advance of the meetings 
but there's then an attempt to embargo the um, press to report on them. So it, it seems to me that you have something that's in the public domain that the media can then not report on. It seems to me not to make sense. Um, and uh, so it's neither desirable nor sustainable uh, around that. Uh, my view would be that the, the, the uh, paper should be released in, you know, publicly before the meeting, and then the media would have the ability to report on um, those papers. Can I suggest it goes a little bit further than that? The SPA decided to restrict the publication of papers on the same day at meetings, in part to mitigate against issues being played out in the meeting before the, uh, the board had an opportunity to discuss it. What's coming through here is a real fear of the media. And I think that raises huge questions. Sorry, that, 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 to me, it was more the specific issue around embargo. And the embargo came from that very unusual set of circumstances about putting things in publicly and then trying to embargo them, which didn't make sense. No, the wider issue uh, that you've identified is absolutely, I think there was a view among members that um, having these, um, having the media play out um, their reports um, in advance of meetings in some way deprived them for the opportunity to discuss it freely. Um, from that, and they didn't get an opportunity to play it. I, I have a contrary view. My view would be, if these papers are out publicly, it gives opportunities to see what the media and others will make of those papers, and it can actually help inform their own decision making. Would be my take. So I have a different view from where they are. As it is now, they have now agreed that their papers will be released uh, in advance. Well, I think that's a healthy way to proceed, but it does raise questions about the qualities and the skills and the talents of the chair. Um, when there seemed to be this fear of uh, media reporting and to do whatever they could to, to circumvent that. So I, I put it to you, we're now looking at the third chair potentially of SPA and um, for various reasons the previous two seem to, to have been deficient in many ways. Basic things like how do you, have you experienced handling the media? What kind of um, experience do you have engaging with staff? All of these things. Is it not now time, then, to look at how the SPA uh, chair is appointed, which is currently by ministers, and think perhaps of um, having an appointment system more like the FOI commissioner or the HRI uh, commissioner, the public services commissioner, where the presiding officer of this parliament, together with the cross-party of MSPs, asks very pertinent questions, very searching questions, on every aspect of the skills that the chair would provide. And I suggest to you it couldn't be any worse than the appointments that, that seem to have been made so far. Yeah, I mean, certainly we haven't offered a view around um, the extent to how the selection process would be. I see that would be very much for um, the committee and Parliament to decide if that was something going forward. What, what I would say is that, you know, I would agree with you that it's absolutely critical that the, the right person is recruited into the post of the chair with the right skill sets to take this, this forward. Um, and uh, the selection process to that, I think, would be absolutely critical um, in doing that. Can I just ask... Um the members of the SP can appoint a deputy chair. Have they done so? Yes, they have. They've uh, appointed, I think Nicola Marchant has been appointed as a deputy chair, which was done, I think, at their last public board meeting. But prior to that, they hadn't appointed a no. deputy chair. Was that a failing, do you think? Um, I, I think they had discussed it um, and had decided not to do that. I think, that, that, my own view, I think having a deputy chair is helpful because it provides additional resilience to the chair um, and additional support um, for them. So I, I'm certainly supportive of the deputy chair role. It had been considered previously, I think, and, and discounted. And is there any, um, <coughs> any view that perhaps Mr Flanagan should step down now and the deputy should continue instead? It's, they're, not, they're not discussions I've had and wouldn't see them to be discussions appropriate for me um, around how, that would, um, how it would be and how they would manage his um, departure from the organisation. But I think you did recognise you thought it was right that he had resigned. Yes, I mean, what I said in my report, um, again, it was, it was rec recognising the general point that Parliament and you know, the committee in particular must have confidence in the leadership of policing in Scotland. And if you don't have leadership, confidence in the leadership of policing in Scotland, then that presents, I think, real difficulties. Um, therefore, I, I understand um, um, why Mr Flanagan has resigned. I also welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has agreed to, to expedite the recruitment process and do that as soon as he can um, as well. So, yes, um, we've commented that within a report. Yeah, but in the meantime, Mr Flanagan remains in the post. And what I've said in my report around that is probably looking at, um, given the nature of continuity potentially around some of the things that are ongoing just now, um, 
I suppose, provided that the replacement can be made speedily. Um, for me, it's a balance between having Mr Flanagan remain in post and bringing in interim arrangements to bring somebody else in later on, and perhaps it's about balancing those, those things together. But I think other people will be better placed than me to make those decisions. Thank you, John. John, do you have a supplementary? Thank you, Convener. Uh, Mr Penman, you, you comment, indeed, it's your second of your key findings, is, and I quote here, there is strong support for the Chair from all current board members. Now, given what you've just told us about Parliament and the committees having confidence in the leadership, what, what do you read into that? Because presumably that's a, a comment based on your findings subsequent to, uh, um, well, it is subsequent to the, the, the committees taking the position they did. Yeah, I mean, I'll perhaps ask Jill to comment on just on, on, on the members, because Jill was involved in interviewing um, all the members. I mean, I suppose my, my take on it would be probably people have different experiences and different perspectives of the chair based on how the, the business are, and, and, and what Parliament would see would be the evidence being provided by the chair to the issues that were presented, whereas the board would have a different view of the chair in dealing with the business of the board, and I think very much their views would be based on that. I think they saw the improvement that the chair had brought in under their time, but perhaps, I mean, in terms of Jill, will give I, the I wonder before, oh, could, I, could I maybe just push on that point there? Because y y you do acknowledge they are appreciative of his leadership and, and the direction he has brought to the board. And, and I think it's important to have that on there. But nonetheless, presumably at the time of that co comment being formulated, and I appreciate it was Ms Emery that uh, interviewed people, these same board members were aware of the disquiet within this building about the conduct of the chair. Yes. Yes, um, and in <coughs> fact felt it was quite unfair against the chair and there were some very strong views expressed in support of the chair and a feeling that indeed um, the HMICS inspection or these aspects of inspection having been accelerated to look at specific issues about holding meetings in public, private, about distribution of papers was disproportionate. Um, whilst I would stress that all members of the board cooperated fully and were more than professional in all the dealings that we had, that our team had, um, there was a strong sense that this was um, not really necessary and actually um, had very strong support, um, very positive feedback about the chair. Well, I, I have to say, I, I find that very worrying. But, um, thank you very much. Rona. Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, I wonder if you could clarify the current process for addressing concerns around a board member's conduct, should anything arise? I think we've ident we identified that there's a gap um, in that. We would have, we would have expected um, there to be... It's either something within legislation, something within guidance, or something within the board standing orders would be the normal way in which these things would be dealt with. Um, they didn't apply within legislation or guidance, so we actually looked or asked the SPA to provide us with what the guidance was in their, their standing orders, and they're not there, thus the recommendation for us coming forward. That led us to the conclusion, um, as you'll see within a report, effectively, uh, in the Chair's letter to Moy Ali, he effectively was looking to not appoint her to a board um, from there, which would take the view is in some form restricting her ability to act as a, a, a publicly appointed member. And I suppose we are looking to say by what authority would you do that and by which process um, would you be able to, um, to justify that or authorise it uh, and as an appeals process. That wasn't there and that's why one of our recommendations are we think that should be there to be able to deal with that in the future. Yeah. Are, you, are you confident that the experience that Moy Ali had will not be repeated? And, and is there support for board members should they find themselves at odds with, you know, with the chair? For any reason. I, I, again, I think there's an important role for the chief executive um, in, in dealing with, um, with, with these situations where, um, if there is an issue that has been aligned where the, the chair has a concern around a particular member, I think that the chief executive, as an accountable officer, has a, a role in both providing advice and also providing support around that. What we've said is there needs to be some guidance around that. In our view, there needs to be some right of appeal as well, in, in terms of fairness, yes. that people can have an opportunity to, to, um, to, to look at that. Yeah, and are you confident that will be addressed as you've put that recommendation? I, I, I would think it would be highly unlikely the circumstance would arise again um, from there, and I'd like to think that, that if there was a case, it could be escalated and it would be picked up by the executive, if not that, to Scottish Government. But I think it's, it's something that has to be put forward um, earlier. I think there's also another, a role for other board members um, in picking this up as well and offer challenge around some of these things if they feel that the actions are disproportionate or unfair or mm -hmm. to actually question or challenge the chair. Again, I think a, normal, a, a good performing board would allow some of that to take place as well. Mm -hmm. Well, clearly that didn't happen at 
before. So hopefully it would happen in the future. I, I, I would like to think that our report and the work of uh -huh. the committee and others have identified um, the, the, the standards that are expected uh, and how things should be dealt with. OK, thank you. Stuart. Uh, for, forgive my ignorance, because I suspect it's in the legislation or elsewhere where I could see it. But it occurs to me to ask, uh, what's the process for dismissing a board member? Who does it? How is it done? My, my, my understanding from uh, within, I think, that in the legislation, where I think the members are ultimately appointed by the um, by Scottish ministers, and I think there's an ability for Scottish ministers to demit them from office. So the, the actual removal, I think, is in, in a report. Actually, the actual removal of members uh, is allowed for mm. um, within the, the process. I think on board guidance we cover that um, as well. But in this case, it wasn't about removing a no, member; no. it was about effectively, in my view, restricting a member's ability to perform no, no. a function. Thank you. Building on uh, Margaret Mitchell and uh, Rona Mackay's questions and focusing on uh, recommendation 11 to uh, that the SPA should, as a matter of urgency, review its internal executive structures and provide the necessary capacity to support the chair, board and authority to fulfil its statutory functions. I wondered, uh, do you have a view on how the SPA board could be better supported uh, going forward? For example, what steps now need to be taken to ensure that the board has the appropriate level of expertise, so uh, touching on the recruitment process that you, you, you alluded to earlier, and uh, the governance support in place to allow it to carry on its statutory functions effectively? Uh, as, as I think there's probably two questions in, 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 or two answers in your question there. One is about the board itself and bringing in the, the correct capability, capacity and diversity within the board itself. Um, and I know there's... Um, a lot of effort being done in terms of recruiting new members with a, a range of skills um, that would be viewed as being necessary um, to support the board moving forward, whether that's financial, HR, ICT, and a range of issues that would be supportive of that. Recommendation 11 is very much about the executive structures, um, so the chief executive, the directors, and the composition of the SPA and how it operates to support the board. Um, so, you know, our view is that there needs to be a strengthening of the executive structures to support the board better, almost in a way, I suppose, in terms of the, the, the clerk and the authority, um, you know, would support um, your, your own committee around that sort of member services within a local authority and, and some of those skills that are needed, I think, to just be able to provide the, the expertise around their ability to provide scrutiny. So we think there's more to be done in that area. And is that c capacity or communications or, or a bit of both? Uh, yeah, I think there's capacity. Well, capacity is around, it's just about the time and availability for people to do some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. There's also an issue, I think, about looking at what support do the board need, which I think is behind the recommendation and indeed behind the Cabinet Secretary's um, recent announcement. Um, for, from that, our, our view would be you need to identify what are the skill sets you need for the, even the directors within the Scottish, uh, the, um, Scottish Police Authority and then work out what's needed and then get the right skill set in there as well. So, so there needs to be a, 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 an evaluation, an analysis done of, of what skill gaps? I think there needs to be a wholesale review of the executive structures within the SPA to look at specifically what is, it, what is needed, um, what is its function and how can it best support the members and then build that um, for the future going, uh, going forward. Thanks very much. Margaret. When you carried out your review, was it your um, opinion that the chair and the chief executive worked well together? Um, no, um, is, is the short answer to that. And I think, as I've said in my, my report, we identified um, elements of dysfunction um, in the relationship between the two, which I think, again, um, if I could refer you to the, um, the paragraph, I think, in my report, which, which sets out what we would consider to be a good relationship, the so paragraph 127, we would find an absence of some of that. We would, we would have, you know, a, a good example of that, I think, would be the Moyali situation, where we would have expected, I would have expected the, chief, the chair to have raised his concerns with the chief executive, and the chief executive would then have had an opportunity to have offered advice. Um, that didn't happen. Um, and I think, you know, um, that probably had it happened, it might have uh, resulted in a different outcome um, from there. So uh, that for me, there, there are issues around um, value in the relationship between the chair and the chief executive, understanding the roles um, in particular, and drawing on the expertise of a chief executive. The authority needs to have a strong chief executive, in my view, to support the chair. You see, that didn't happen. Did Mr Foley um, try to offer um, some advice, or was he happy just to to do what he seems, in all fairness, to have done every time he's appeared here, sit quite quietly, unless he's absolutely pinned down with a question. My understanding of the specific issue is that he was not asked by the chair um, prior to the letter going out. How far can an official go, then, in suggesting some advice in these circumstances? 
I have reviewed the Chief Executive as accountable officer and authority and, and effectively the full-time professional who's there has a, a very significant role, you know, and I would expect them to be able to, to offer advice and guidance um, around the chair and, and actually work together as an effective team. And the chair is a you know the chair um, is a part-time function, it's a, a non-executive role. Um, so for me I think the Chief Executive is a, is a critical role within the authority. You know, I would like to think that the chair should, you know, a good relationship would be where the Chief Executive and Chair are working well together and are feeding from each other in terms of their advice. Mm -hmm. So if the the Chief Executive has seen something he thinks was a mistake, you would expect him to to privately say, um, this is my opinion, of course it's up to you to to uh, make the final decision, but this is my opinion, the reasons why. Um, yes, yeah, I would. I think that would be a good functioning relationship between chief executive. I think if it was something that was um, significant and would have an impact on the authority or the policing of Scotland, I think it would be incumbent upon the chief executive to have the same view with other members and actually you know, have an ability where that would be shared with other non-exec members and the chair and perhaps have a discussion um, with, or with them in relation to you know, what the issue was. So good would look like a particular issue being aired by the chief executive with the chair and with other members to then allow other members to form of you and support the chair or, or, or assist the chair uh, in his decision making. I think it would be helpful. You mentioned a number of areas where you would expect the chief executive and input. You give the example of the, the Moye Ali situation. Could you outline the other areas that you think the chief executive should be strong and um, have, have a, an input? I, mean, I, I think just generally, I think the, the chief executive should have a view of all the businesses coming beyond coming to the board, and is able to offer a view to the chair and to members, and offer expert advice to them on that. And without getting drawn into lots of specifics, my, my, you know, I think the chief executive should, you know, is effectively there to run the SPA um, from the executive side with the direction of the board. So I, I would expect the, the chief executive to have discussions on most issues with the chair and on most of the substantive business that uh, the board would discuss. Forgive me, in um, your original answer, your first answer to me, you mentioned a specific paragraph. And oh, sorry, no. Um, so paragraph 127 is, is from Audit Scotland, and it, it basically describes um, what is seen as being you know, an effective relationship between the chair yeah. and the chief executive. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, so for me, that was just talking about that, that. That is what Audit Scotland would demonstrate as being the, what good looks like um, with a chief executive and a chair. And you agree with that, then? Obviously. I agree absolutely with Audit Scotland, and I say there's probably absence of that within what we saw in the Police Authority. Okay, thank you. Supplementaries from John and then Stuart. Yeah, thank you, Kavina. Uh, Mr. Penn, we're, we're grateful for your report. It's it's it's, it's very comprehensive. I, th I think it's uh, its layout lends itself to evidencing all the points you've made. You've, you and your staff have had the benefit of more regular contact with the Scottish Police Authority and indeed the individuals. Do you have confidence in the Chief Executive of the Scottish Police Authority? My position around the, 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 the chief executive is that um, there, there needs to be an effective relationship with the chair and they need to have the skill set that's necessary for moving on um, policing in the new structures and the views. I would hope that the recommendation that we have put in place, which is to look at the executive structures within the SPA, will also look at what skill sets and things are required um, from that and determine what the best mix of team and staff would be. Well, separating the individual from the role and to push a bit further, you could be saying this has identified a, a training needs analysis for the role. It's, it's, for me, it's probably identified two things. It's identified, um, in fairness to the individual, it's identified an issue with, um, with him and his team where, because of abstractions of directors and, in some respect, I think confusion among various roles within the SPA director level, that the chief executive has limited capacity. He's very, very busy. He's doing lots of different things and, and, and it's been spread quite thinly. So there's an issue around his capacity to be able to, to deal effectively with the work that he has. So if that was addressed, then that would have a positive impact. There's also, for me, something around the relationship between the chair and the chief executive, um, which has to be effective uh, in the discussion uh, to Mr Mitchell's come. Uh, a question earlier. And in your dealings, um, did the chief executive highlight capacity issues to you? Did he say that this was? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and, and very frankly, um, in conversations with him, uh, identifying he has four directors, I think uh, effectively, I think one, one director uh, is still available to him. One has been uh, seconded. One is off long term um, sick, uh, unfortunately. So he he has lost a lot of that support um, that's there, and uh, he has spread very thinly. We will be publishing a, a report on forensic um, services that Joe. Uh, has led on that also identifies just issues around his responsibility for the forensic services 
over and above everything else, we believe to be uh, too much for the role and needs to be separated. So the capacity issue is effectively is for the current chief executive is just very busy and spreading herself very thinly. And was he proactive in, in highlighting uh, capacity issues, or is it just in reaction to? No, in fairness, if you say in the conversation, he's been he's been clear um, to us around the kind of capacity issues that he has. Yes, no, uh, sorry, I meant in advance to others. To do you know if that's been raised? In terms of conversations with board members, I I, I don't, but the, the, um, I, I don't know. The cabinet secretary, perhaps. I, I, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Are you aware if stakeholders are confidence in the senior management of the, of the SPA? Probably a question best led to them. I, I think they, they certainly are unhappy with the, the level of engagement that they have currently with the senior leadership uh, of the SPA would be probably as, as, as much mm. as I'd be able to answer based on their inspection. OK, thank you. Stuart. Um, mine's a relatively mechanical question. I, d I just wanted to know if there's a formal system by which the non-execs and execs know what each other are actually doing. In particular, if a non-exec the chair, for example, issues a letter. How co does the chief executive see the copy of that letter? I'm used to an environment in my previous life where we had a, what we called the daybook system, and a copy of everything that went out had to go in the daybook, and the next person up the line had to initial it within a single working day to show they'd seen it. Is there an equivalent formal system by which people who are making the real decisions whether exec or non-exec, are aware of the communication activity and the decisions that each other are making. And if there is not, would you care to comment as to whether there should be? Yeah, my, my view would be that they are I'm not certainly not aware of a process, and one of our recommendations is actually about um, looking for them to improve even things like their minutes and their rec record keeping of their minutes, the retention of them, uh, and, and doing them. So I, I think there is definitely an issue around communication. I think the issue in relation to my own letter, for example, probably highlighted mm -hmm. where a letter coming into the organisation wasn't circulated um, to members. And I understand, you know, that, that there, no, there is now a process being put in place to ensure that happens again. But um, so I would agree, yes. There needs to be a process by which there's better exchange and people are clear what the rules are. Do, do they have a register of things they receive, uh, such as that, which you would think might be an important communication? Not, not that we didn't look at that specifically. I mean, they absolutely will have administrative processes in place, um, but that's not quite going to the same point. OK, uh, that you thank made. you, Camilla. Thank you. As there are no um, further questions from members, can I thank both of our witnesses for coming along today? We really appreciate you taking the time to come along. We have covered a fair number of, of things today in a, in a very effective and, and, and quick manner, and I, I do appreciate that you, you have done that. If there are any further um, questions that arise, I, I, I will contact you, and if you could perhaps respond in writing to the committee on any further issues that, that arise. So thank you again. And can I now close the 13th meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing in 2017, and the next subcommittee meeting will, meet, will be on Thursday the 14th of September. Seems a long time away. A long time away. Thank you.